What are the characteristics of human predators? How do high control cultic and high demand groups gain control and use manipulation to target different people? Today, I welcome John Atak, who is not only a former member of Scientology who bravely speaks out about his experience, but is also a leading expert in the field of high control and high demand groups to come on my channel and discuss manipulative tactics used and the characteristics of human predators. So stay tuned. and welcome to my channel or welcome back to my channel. If you're returning, I'm Rachel Ann. I'm a licensed therapist and I make videos of psychological commentary on current events, cultic and high control groups, and I am very anti-scam. If this sounds like something that you're into, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future videos. My guest today is John Atak. Author John Atak is an expert on manipulation and undue influence. His best-selling history of science Ontology, Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky was published in 1990. He has helped over 600 people in their own recovery from abuse in high control groups. He is recognized as an expert witness by English High Court and has been consulted in more than 150 court cases around the world. In the mid 1990s, understanding that the same dynamics apply in all coercive relationships, he shifted his focus to the broad range of groups and individuals using manipulation. In more recent Recently, coercive control in personal relationships. Without further ado, let me go ahead and just get right into the interview for today. Hi, John. Welcome to my channel. It's so nice to have you here. This has been a long awaited, anticipated interview. So, welcome. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. For those that are not aware of all of the work that you have done and just your involvement in cultic groups and high demand groups, would you mind sharing what ignited your interest in these particular topics and predatorial groups? Well, at the age of 19, I was lured into the Scientology group and um, I had nine years. I was never a living member. So uh, unlike most people, I wasn't humiliated and abused. Mm. At the end of nine years, I left. I found my, and I left because I believed in Scientology and I thought that Ron Hubbard had died. And I, be, I was at the center of, a, of an independent Scientology movement in, in the United Kingdom. And after about six months, I, I completely lost faith. And I found myself, it was a very strange situation because I found myself defending the independent Scientologists from the terrible harassment of the, the mother cult, but not believing myself anymore. And I, be, I wrote a book about the, in fact, uh, the only history of, of Scientology. I think it might be the only history of any post-Second mm. World group, which is called Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky. I worked with the renowned biographer Russell Miller as his researcher for his excellent book, Barefaced Messiah, about Hubbard. And I've published I don't know, about 500 articles and papers over the years. I've put out 300 videos. I've spoken at many conferences. My interests through the 1990s shifted from just Scientology. By then, I, I wanted to understand what the psychology was. Mm. And so you know, in the 80s, I, I became close friends with Steve Hassan. We remained close friends. I met Margaret Singer, Jolly West, many of the significant figures at that time. And made a study of social psychology from the outside, mm. looked at tens of different groups and gradually constructed my own hypothesis about authoritarianism, which to me is the, the central topic, mm. and began to talk about human predators. I, I've written a number of books. The, the last book was, was Opening Our Minds, which seeks to show that there's a spectrum from one-on-one -on -one abuse in personal intimate relationships right through to nations you know north yes. korea and of course what putin is doing at the moment as mm -hmm. well where authoritarianism is occurring which is to say that you have somebody who thinks they should be in charge and they bully other people and you have people who for whatever reason submit to that subjugation and my quest in life is, is to make that more comprehensible to people so that they won't be lured into such relationships themselves they'll recognize human predators and the worst 
such people who somehow seem to find political office very easily. Yes, they do. They do. And it still does surprise me, but sometimes it doesn't because I have certainly noticed such an intense pattern of narcissism and that ability to inflate one's standing and skills. And so I must ask you, what have you noticed in terms of how predators get into positions of power? What seems to happen particularly is, that I see is that there is uncertainty, that, mm-hmm. that in times when we're, we're waiting for disaster, we're in the midst of disaster, when somebody comes along and says, I know the answer, yes, then we tend to follow. It, it's surprising looking at Hitler that uh, what 45% of doctors in Germany joined the Nazi party. Mm. And it, it didn't matter that they'd spent you know, however many years studying in university. They followed his certainty. If you look at his arguments, his arguments are ridiculous. They're ludicrous. They make no sense at all. But people fell in behind him. And we see that all over the world. We, we, we now have a plague mm-hmm. of authoritarian leaders. And I, I think there's a factor of charm that, that such people can appear to be very charming. Yes. They know how to flatter people. Mm-hmm. And, um, mm-hmm. We are all of us a little bit susceptible to that, I fear. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And we justify their meanness. We sort of, you know, say, well, they were pushed to that. That was necessary because. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it becomes, it can become that irrational that people, they identify with a cause, they identify with a nation, they identify with a set of political or religious ideas, and they become fervent about that. Mm -hmm. And getting them to sit down, put their emotions aside and think is extremely difficult because their whole identity is caught up in belonging to Russia or or, or North Korea or what have you. And getting people to the reason is not an easy um, prospect, as I'm sure you have professionally found. Certainly. Yes. And it's always fascinating to me how on such a small scale, relationships where there is abuse present, it lends its hand to being so similar to full-scale groups where abuse is occurring. And so I noticed that you are definitely studying and have been immersed in, and in your book, if I'm not mistaken, Opening Our Minds also begins to talk about and cover and go in depth intimate relationships. Yes. And so what are your thoughts on the manipulative tactics that are sometimes used towards susceptible people? I guess we all are susceptible to a certain level. I think we all are. And I I think, you know, a typical mistaken belief to think that people who are attracted into these relationships are unintelligent or weak, that vulnerability is often a matter of you're being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm-hmm. In, in my understanding, we, we all develop incredibly complex habits and routines in our lives. Mm-hmm. And as soon as we are moved away from those routines, we become susceptible. Now, that could be a bad relationship breakup, mm-hmm. but it can also, I mean, commonly people are recruited into authoritarian cults either in their first term at college when you know, emotionally, teenagers are more likely to be infatuated, or after retirement, you know, mm-hmm. as they are older, those are the, the periods of emotional vulnerability. But I think any transition in mm-hmm. life, you know, moving to another town, getting into another, we want to belong, we want to be part of a group. Yes, that opens us up. So it is, in fact, our very sociability that makes us vulnerable. And, you know, you can decide to close the door and not have anything to do with anybody and or you are going to engage with people and it's then looking at you know the first thing that I think is really relevant to understand is if anybody comes to you and they're tremendously friendly in their approach they might just be a very friendly person Mm -hmm. a very friendly person but I think we should be suspicious of anybody who comes along and is seeking to be our new best friend because they are probably going to try and sell us something. Excellent point. Yes. Whether it's a product or 
you know, a, a belief system. And they the, the first way in will be flattery. It's an interesting word. It means insincere praise. Mm. And so somebody is coming along and telling us how wonderful we look or your skills are above all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It's a softening up process. It's a, mm-hmm. it's a getting you ready to then reach in and, and pull you along. Often, you know, recruiters for groups are selected because they, they have their manner and, and their, their appearance. And uh, I mean, Steve Hassan says that, that he couldn't help but go to the Moonies three day event because these pretty girls were asking him to go, you know. Yeah, um, and that's interesting. I have someone who I'm very close to, and they mentioned to me that they had visited a uh, religious organization. And this gentleman specifically said all the women were beautiful, but they were just so doting and flattering. And this person it just picked up on that right away and said, something is not right. I mean, I don't want to doubt myself, but I know that this didn't feel genuine. And mm-hmm. so that just speaks to the point that you're making the flattery, the love bombing. It, it's such a, ne- it's a necessary ingredient. And indeed the, the term love bombing was invented by the Moonies. And a lot of my work has, has been spotting the similarities. So when I, in the 90s, I started studying terrorism before 9-11 mm-hmm. and, and looking at historic ter- terrorist groups and contemporary groups and saying, mm-hmm. well, they, they run along the same lines. You know, there's mm-hmm. the same tricks are being used here. And when I finally saw a copy of the Al-Qaeda recruitment manual, it was shockingly close wow. to the, the manuals that are used in the Moonies and in Scientology to, to get people. Um, Unbelievable. Yeah. Just to go back to something you shared about vulnerable times in a person's life and the age of of college years, I just so happened to read an article where a gentleman was tried and found guilty for running a cult at Sarah Lawrence College. He was the father of one of the students and moved himself into his daughter's dorm room. And from there created a a high control group where there was sleep deprivation, behavioral control, and eventually it lended its hand to being a bit of a, a, a sex cult. And it just, it was so damaging. And so anyways, he was found guilty, but even in the courtroom, he had multiple episodes of medical issues, you know, mm-hmm. otherwise very healthy gentlemen. But I just thought it was so manipulative up until the very end, until being found guilty. I mean, watching Oscar Pistorius in the courtroom, you know, when he was up for sentencing and he took off his leg extensions so you could see the stumps of his legs and he whined at the court. And again, that's something else with malignant narcissists and mm that type of human predator, that they will they will become self-pitying at, at the slightest push. Mm. And they'll go from having incredible bravado and self-confidence to collapsing in, into tears about how unpleasant the world is towards them. Yes, the chameleon-esque mentality mm. and lifestyle. To me, it's fascinating from afar, not to be friends with someone, but even clinically, clinical presentations of individuals who commit crimes in one aspect of their life, but then present so differently when hospitalized. I mean, it's just such an interesting dynamic. I, I mean, with Ted Bundy. Yes. People who were at um, law school with him were tremendously shocked. They said he was the most charming of people <laughs> and of, of course his practice was the deliberate stranger he would only prey upon people he'd never met before mm-hmm. and it, it is something to watch it's so easy to to sort of put aside people's bad behavior i, I am very much of, of the idea that we should absolutely forgive and we should never forget mm-hmm. that if somebody has done something peculiar then by all means forgive them for what they've yes. done if, if they show some contrition for what they've done the first first time shame on you the second time shame on me and determine how reliable people are if somebody has lied to you once if somebody has made a promise that they broke once by all means forgive them Mm -hmm. the second time they do it 
be suspicious. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think some people don't like that philosophy, but I, I think that it's a form of protecting yourself. And it's not necessarily holding on to animosity, which can make you sick. It's just remembering for your own protection. I fully support that. I must ask you if you are comfortable sharing, how did your process unfold of seeing the, the, the proverbial light, you know, seeing clarity or, or starting to disengage from Scientology? It was really very straightforward. A guy who um, was traveling the world had gone and seen a lawyer who was, had 25 cases against Scientology. And we were all of us now exploring because in Scientology, we were not meant to talk about anything that was going wrong. Mm. It was, I mean, somebody has just challenged me. I, I, I gave a talk at Eton College a, a few weeks ago, which was incredible. Mm. And we put the talk up and somebody has said, well, you know, how can John not have known about the intelligence agency functioning inside Scientology? And my response is, how many American citizens know what the CIA is doing? Just mm -hmm. because you belong to a particular group doesn't mean you, and it, and it was very much an intelligence agency. Mm. So my friend visited Michael Flynn in Boston and he came back with a stack of documents and he said to me, he said, oh, I'm never going to read these. Uh, so you have them. And these documents were collected by a, a journalist called Michael Lynn Shannon, who is otherwise unknown to history because he never published. Uh, he very sensibly got out of the way. I don't believe that's his real name. I tried to find him for several oh, interesting. years. Interesting. Okay. Because he realized what Scientology would do, and they do. They, they harassed me for 16 years solid on a daily basis. Oh. Uh, it continues to some extent. There are still websites with ridiculous nonsense. I did it. see one. And yes. just, re just reading through it, I could tell. I mean, anyone outsider looking in, it seemed completely nonsensical. <laughs> Any, but that's besides the point, not to derail you. The, the documents were, for example, his university records, which showed he claimed that he was a nuclear physicist. And his university records showed that he had failed atomic and molecular physics before uh -huh. being thrown out of university. Uh -huh. Many years later, I found a, a tape recorded lecture by Hubbard where he admitted that he had failed this course which of course, it's not actually a nuclear physics course, atomic and molecular physics to split hairs perhaps, is not the same subject. You're not dealing with the same principles at all. From there, I made a very deep dive. I have something like 100, no, probably about 60 bankers boxes full of material about wow. Hubbard's life and about Scientology, mm -hmm. um, which I very happily put into a university collection somewhere because I, I stopped working on Scientology or investigating it. Did you? Yeah. In a serious way, back in 1996, mm -hmm. I, I still interview former members. It was very interesting when the guy who was running harassment for 20 years, Mike Rinder, came out and I was able to actually interview him. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah. He, we, he took, we'd only met once and he'd come over here. I live in Nottingham in England. And he and a whole group of these top people from Scientology flew in to have this meeting with me and my lawyer. I walked out of the meeting after about 10 minutes because they wouldn't say who they were. You know, they, they were there to intimidate me. My lawyer wanted them to give me money. And I'd already rejected the idea of my silence being a quantity that could be bought. Yes. Good for you. I left the meeting and here I am still talking. But Mike said that in that meeting, he, he said, oh, you seem like a perfectly nice guy. You know, you mm -hmm. seem like very reasonable. But I would have destroyed you if I could mm -hmm. because you're opposing Scientology. And Scientology is, was the only hope for humanity. He's since, on, since gone on to run um, Aftermath, the, the wonderful TV show with mm -hmm. uh, Leah Remini and yes. a game podcast. Mm -hmm. but, and, and Mike is... Mike's one of those very interesting characters who is undoubtedly an empath. He is somebody who's really positive. And mm -hmm. this is one of the things that I wandered into, that you can take empaths and you can weaponize them. Yes. You can sell yeah. them on the idea of saving the world and then get them to do deplorable things. Absolutely. Um, so it sounds like you started to recognize that not all of these pieces were adding up. 
and seeing that there were some lies. It was instantaneous for me because mm. Hubbard claimed, you know, he said, honesty is sanity. He talked about Scientology being the road to truth. And he said the road to truth must be trod with true steps. So as soon as I realized that he was a liar, I knew that there was something wrong with Scientology. Yeah. Two or three months after that, for me to pull my head out of the thinking, I'd been involved for nine years. Wow. And probably some years to get all of it out. Mm -hmm. But I made a very determined decision, which many people don't, mm -hmm. which was to reject everything in Scientology and then think about it piecemeal, think about the ideas and see if I still accepted them. Mm -hmm. And 38 years later, I, I don't accept any of them. There is nothing that wasn't stolen from somewhere else. And when it was mm -hmm. stolen, it was changed in some way to fit in with Hubbard's way of thinking. And I think it is typical of such people that, that you know, in researching stories he told about his life, he talked about wrestling with a bear. And there are different versions of this story. He couldn't tell the, sa the story the same way <laughs> twice. And I, the pathological lying. Yes. It, it's, it's quite typical of such people. Mm -hmm. For me, the clincher was finding places where he'd completely contradicted himself. And what interested me most of all was that when I took that, because I was still very much connected with the ex-Scientology community and most of the people I knew were still practicing Scientology, mm -hmm. I'd go to them and say, well, look, he says here that he was crippled and blinded at the end of World War II. And yet he says here that he was down in Hollywood two weeks before the war ended, three weeks before the war, and he beat up three petty officers. So crippled and blinded. And with, with one woman, she looked at me and she said, well, the answer to that's obvious. And I said, really? She said, well, he obviously had two bodies. Oh, gosh. So now we're getting into not shape-shifting, but just being in two places at two different times. <laughs> two bodies. And when I challenged her and, and said, but, but, you know, he claimed to be a war hero, and yet he actually saw no service in World War II. It's not true. Mm -hmm. He saw a service, but he didn't, didn't see combat at any point in World War II. And she said, yes, he did. And I said, well, how do you know that? And she said, I served with him in his like, oh my. last lifetime. So people will build any justification because they have invested all of their hope into this. Yes. And that is yeah. my experience that all of their desperation or all of their hope is invested which is probably why the suicide rate in Scientology is significantly higher mm. than in the world around, because when people's hope is taken from them, they collapse. Absolutely. Yes. And as you had mentioned, I mean, the person's identity becomes so intertwined. And I, I, I also have noticed that there are some seemingly, whether it's the love bombing in the beginning or the, the, the wonderful welcome that people have into a high control group or some bits of knowledge that do feel good, there are maybe some tiny good pieces. And part of me wonders if that even can prolong or help keep the claws of the group in the member because they're holding on to hope for that good feeling. Have you noticed that? Or what are your thoughts on that process? I, I think the, the process is very much like an intimate relationship that you have a honeymoon mm -hmm. period. Yes. You have a period of infatuation. And in that honeymoon period, you, you won't hear anything wrong about the, the new partner. You only see what's good about them. Mm -hmm. Later on, you know, what was seen to be spontaneous is seen to be impetuous. The, the same behaviours now have become negative. And people in authoritarian groups will attach in, that's how we attach, we, we fall in love. Yes. And then you have the, you know, the unwillingness to see what's wrong. And you also have the thing, again, in a personal relationship, where you look back to the glow you look back to how good you felt and you go let's let's find our way back to that exactly. and of course if, when you're dealing with a predator of course they're they're apologizing to you and saying they won't do it again and mm -hmm. you know you we want to believe that also when we're attached to an individual or a group it's scary to go out on your own scary to leave that it's definitely mm -hmm. then of course you get the divorce and and the the you know, one of the problems that can occur with former members is that they become too negative. Sadly, that's been picked up by 
people like Gordon Melton and uh, before him, Brian Wilson, the sociologist, both of whom were paid by Scientology. Wow. No doubt of that. And they put forward this argument, you can't trust anything that a former member said, which is rather like saying, you know, if you left the Nazi party, then nothing you say about it will be accurate. Mm-hmm. It's also mm-hmm. denying a fundamental human right of expression and, and of observation. And I, I would say, as a former member, Mm-hmm. that my work can be checked. There are nearly 1,200 footnotes in, in my book about Scientology, and anybody mm-hmm. can go and check them. But there will also be people who are deeply upset. And instead of looking at the leader of the group and the teachings of the group, they will attack the members of the group. All the members can provide so much help to yes. the people who are still currently involved, but instead they see them as the enemy. And they're not. They're people who've been tricked and lied to in the same way that they were. Most definitely. And that's why I I have such a soft place in my heart for the survivors of these cultic groups and even survivors of domestic violence relationships, because people are so quick to judge and say, oh, that would never happen to me. And like you said, they're unintelligent or they're weak, but that's not the case. I mean, Many people are so highly educated and have had their own experiences in the world. And just to go back to what you were saying with the infatuation piece, because you bring up so many good points. I even think about the release of of dopamine and just the positive flow that, that physiologically goes through our bodies when we fall in love, when we have a great conversation or feel seen and heard. And these predators, as you know, are expert at letting somebody feel seen and heard and and as if they understand them. And if you flatter somebody, you'll likely get an oxytocin response in them. You'll quite possibly get a serotonin response Mm -hmm, in them. mm -hmm. Endorphin levels may rise up. And it it's important for us. I think it's an aspect of maturity to grow up to the point where you can sit back from a conversation and think about what it is the other person wants from you. Yes. How they're going about it. And obviously, you and I, because we deal with this, we notice it more. Yes. If, if somebody is trying to uh, manipulate us in some way. But it, and it's, it amazes me that nothing is taught about this in our schools. Right. Right. No safeguards, no classes, even even classes on creating healthy boundaries and emotionally protecting yourself. They aren't even taught. And so I I think that would be an excellent addition. And I, for the last few months, have been working on some materials for such courses Mm. uh, because I really believe that it is possible in a single generation to change attitudes because this is information that's been withheld and it's not complicated right you know, understanding you know as i say if somebody approaches you and they're really friendly towards you mm-hmm. they're probably trying to sell you something you don't need to be nasty to them but you should be cautious yeah i i agree i think it's always just assessing situations and assessing for a potential motive hmm. and even from a the provider side of things i i can see how physicians or people in positions of power over somebody's medical life. I mean, even that must be, I believe, really eyed carefully because any sense of power can be taken advantage of. Yeah, I think that's really true and and really important. Even people in authority with eight years of training will just, well, this is what the drug companies say, so we'll do this without really understanding. You have to have somebody who understands the subject and the substance and can diagnose properly, rather than somebody who's just handing out a pill and somebody's believing that it should, you know, their their authority is enough. Yes, yes. And I encourage everyone to always ask questions. I think the, the underlying thing is we don't have to believe what we're told. And in addition one size does not fit all. And that is the biggest issue that I have with high control groups is the, there is the expectation that their doctrine is the word. No one is to go against it. And so almost similar to whereas meditation may be helpful for you and I, it may not be helpful for someone else. And we are Mm -hmm. allowed to 
pick and choose. But with the high, high control groups, the power of choice is very much lacking or completely absent. It, it's also fair to say, you know, the, yes, exactly. The cookie cutter method. Mm-hmm. It's also mm-hmm. fair to say that, that one of the reasons that people become involved in groups is because they will offer a technique mm. that leads to a peak experience. It leads to a euphoria or a sense of being high. Mm-hmm. When I came away from Scientology, you see, I already knew when I went in and we were told to sit and stare at each other. Yes. Uh, I knew that that you would start hallucinating because I'd done a year's meditation before that, and I knew that you, you know, the room would bend and things would change. Mm-hmm. What I didn't know was that these were typical aspects of altered states of being or trance states, mm-hmm. and you feel euphoric. You feel great. Yes, and yes. Chanting, singing, jumping up and down, dancing. There are all sorts of methods. And those things will make you feel exhilarated. Absolutely. Exhilarated doesn't necessarily mean that you've improved in any way. And people, I think, become addicted to the techniques. And they, they just as with drug users, that generally when somebody first uses a drug, that's the highest they'll get with that drug. Mm-hmm. And after that, they're trying to get that experience back. And so you have sort of cult junkies, people who, because whenever they go to the, you know, the Kingdom Hall service, yes. they feel all right again. And again, it's desperation that's being treated. It's keeping yourself cut off from the world mm-hmm. because the world might be painful. And it's generally better to open up to the world. It's generally yes. better... To, you know, and one of the things that really bothers me is when people won't talk about something mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. it might threaten the beliefs they have. Now, if the beliefs they have are true, they've got nothing to worry about how to talk. And it almost seems like that can even that the, the secrecy that must be maintained, whether on that small scale of being in a relationship with somebody who's abusive or as we're talking about in these large groups, yeah. to me, the secrecy is always a red flag. What, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I couldn't agree more. As I started to hear stories about Ron Hubbard during the last few weeks that, that, that I believed, I suddenly had access to people and you were never meant to say anything bad. Now, I'd not been near him. I'd not worked in the organization. I had no idea that people were living for months on a diet of rice and beans and nothing else. Uh, no idea that they yeah. were working 90 hour week. They weren't seeing their children. Nobody would say these things. It was all, we're we're all smiling, we're all happy. Mm -hmm. Suddenly I had access to people who were no longer under those constraints. Mm -hmm. And I realized, I mean, there's a particular guy that I talked with who'd worked on Hubbard's, Hubbard made these little films, all of which have been withdrawn. (laughs) They, They were pretty awful. But he put together a huge crew and made these films. And he was so incredibly abusive. This is in about 1977, 78. He was so abusive to all of the people Mm. around him. And my idea of of the ideal human being is is somebody who has equanimity. Yes. That they don't lose their temper, that they don't feel they have to dominate and punish other people. Mm -hmm. And so I found that I'd been following a raging maniac all of these years, and it had been concealed from me because... People want you to see the best. We have the same thing with the awful abuse of children mm-hmm. in the, the Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, the Baptist Church, the Methodist Church, the Jehovah's, Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm-hmm. It's covered yes. up. I mean, the Jehovah's Witnesses talk about having 23,000 abuse, known abusers, and they will not release the names to the authorities because of you know, some religious confidentiality that they mm-hmm. believe mm-hmm. exists. And they, of course, they lost a a case here um, where they were charged as as having given the charge of children to Mm -hmm. an individual who was a a known abuser, a convicted abuser. Mm -hmm. We also find that they actually recruited in prisons and these people would be forgiven for what they'd done. Mm -hmm. And then they would marry a widow who had children. But that cover up, that sense of my church or my community is, is more important than the truth. Yes. What might happen again? What happened to my identity Mm -hmm. if it proves that that I'm part of a group that isn't really benign, that isn't really positive? 
it's hard to separate. That's what I've seen. And even some of the materials that I release and studying certain groups, you know, the vitriol that is spewed at people who go against someone's group can be just intense for lack of a better word. And so I, I also think that can go into why people continue to stay silent or don't speak out. Because even as you mentioned, I mean, the harassment that you received for years, it's a nightmarish situation. And, and you know, members of science, I, I, was, uh, I was talking with a man, a guy called Skip Press, who's an ex-Scientologist. And he was thanking me because he'd read my book and that had caused him mm. to leave Scientology. And then he said that, that when he told Scientology he'd read my book, they'd sent some people around and they'd said, well, you know, John Atak used to be a heroin addict. And I went, what? What are you talking about? I've never taken heroin in my life. I've, I've never physically seen heroin, you know, and they've been in the same room with it. But he sort of brushed me aside and said, well, you know, whatever. So no, hang on. You know they've accused yes. me of attempted murder. They've accused me. Of, they, they've accused me of a child. Mm. These are typical things which will then be believed by the followers. And and you're sort of saying, and so why didn't I? Why was I never convicted of any of these things? Why was I never charged or taken to court if, mm-hmm. if you have ever these things? Why was I allowed to bring up my four children? This kind of black and white thinking. This. You know, everything becomes binary, everything becomes wrong or right, rather yes. than understanding all of those gradations of truth that exist. And people become oppositional, they become emotional and, and overwhelmed. And mm-hmm. there is no way that reasoning can survive those strong emotions. There's no way that we can be, you know, we have to be dispassionate to be rational. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And it also just from you mentioning your experience, which thank you for sharing where people accused you of so many different things. They still do. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, it just goes to show that there's such the high discouragement of any kind of critical thinking, or like you said, the rational thought of current members. It's just the strong adherence, what we say is truth. And so would you also say that that is a red flag, even if it's a workplace environment? Yes, I think the insistence that that one has the truth, we need to be skeptical. Yeah, I did a series of interviews with a, a Scientologist called Andy Nolch, and in Australia. And he, he interviewed me, he wanted to interview me for his channel that I didn't research him and I should have done. Mm-hmm. Um, but even if I had done, I'd probably have had the conversations because mm-hmm. I'm a very gregarious human being. And he posted the interviews on his channel, but I mm-hmm. didn't post them because I found out that, that he had been in prison for mm-hmm. basically drawing a giant prior to a memorial for a woman who'd been murdered. Mm. Which was, you know, he, he's anti-feminist. Plus, I did the interviews, and then I decided not to post them. And because I hadn't posted them, he did a video attacking me. Oh wow! Mm-hmm. John Atac debunked, and it was a wonderful opportunity to to look at what he was saying. And so, mm-hmm. my favorite video of the three hundred or so on, on my channel is going through these things line by line and saying, "Okay, well, let's look at that." And I, I'm, I am very grateful. I know I've said this, but I am grateful that you have, you're so willing to share your experiences because it's something that's so relatable. I mean, how many times do we get an invitation to whether it's a meeting or even just recently, I had an email where someone was wanting to interview me on their TV channel. And I did some research and found that they're promoting a very strange form of therapy that has no peer reviewed research. And it's a matter of, um, you know, I I don't want to promote that. I don't want to be affiliated with that. And, but it happens all the time, John, to so many of us, whether it's a, a, an email or at church or a community group. And and so I'm grateful that you shared that just as even that to me is good feedback for folks to think about who's asking you to do this and what are they about? What are they involved in? Question the source of information and what the benefits are to the person giving you that information. Yes. There are so many subject areas here, human trafficking, Mm. um, Mm -hmm. pedophile grooming, uh, multi-level marketing, you know, that, 
yes. somebody wants to show you the plan and get you involved with Amway or something. That's that right. All of these structures, all of the get rich quick schemes, mm-hmm. all of the, you know, I just need to get, I'm a Nigerian prince and I just need a few dollars to be able to free up millions and I'll share them with you, you know, or the, the young woman who's approaching you and suddenly needs airfare. We live in a world of scams and we, we, we live do. in a world. And that, thankfully, it is just a fairly small proportion of people, mm-hmm. probably less than 5% of people who are intent upon scamming us. Mm-hmm. But it has, of course, all moved onto the internet now, even cult recruitment. And, and we do need to be very careful. It's very easy to sign up for, for things that, that, that will go against our better interests. It absolutely is. And I I think that even when we receive invitations from, I I think about a close family member of mine who is very skeptical, but they received an invitation uh, to have a meeting about a great product. Thankfully, this person said, this is a cult. I mean, they were able to just see right through it, but they knew the person. And so there was that familiarity, which is a form of affinity fraud in and of itself. Well, John, I could continue to speak with you probably for hours. So much knowledge, so easy to talk to. Thank you. Absolutely. Do you have any final words or, or words of wisdom that you would like to impart on listeners or viewers? And then, of course, where can others get your book, Opening Our Minds? What? My books are available through through any bookstore. Um, they're available on Amazon as ebooks. Uh, Opening our minds is also available as an audio book on mm. Audible. And I, I I think it is you know basically the simple piece of advice to people is think twice. If something sounds too good to be true, it will be. Yes. There is no such thing as a free lunch or in Scientology a free personality test. If somebody if something seems seductive and wonderful. Separate yourself from that environment, even if it just means you're know, going to the bathroom. That's Take right. yourself away from the environment and think about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Preferably get your cell phone and talk to a friend about it before doing yes. anything. Use a search engine and look the person up. Check things. Mm-hmm. Just get into the habit of, of checking things out. It's not rude. You know, you don't have to be unpleasant to the person. They don't even have to know that you're checking them out. That's right. But be skeptical in the world. And when you, you know, if you find out that the product is wonderful, that the religion is true, that the psychotherapy does work, then that's fine. Mm-hmm. You won't have done any harm by, by taking your time about it. So think twice. I think that's beautiful. I think that is great advice that's so relatable that can be applied to a range of different experiences in life. So thank you, John. Thank you so much for being here. And I'll look forward to staying in touch. Great. It's been wonderful meeting you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. 